Are you an ethical tourist? For those who've enjoyed the privilege of travel for pleasure, once you've gotten past the fluctuating frustrations of airport security, the cattle-like conditions of the economy, and battled for your belongings at baggage claim, how do you navigate the places you visit? Besides parroting the mantra of take nothing but photos, leave nothing but footprints, how much thought have you given to the way you affect the worlds beyond your own? Folks travel for many different reasons. At least in the context of travel for pleasure and not necessity, travel is an escape from the routine, a chance to break free from the monotony of everyday life and navigate the new. There are those who travel to connect, either with themselves, with loved ones, or with their heritage. Many choose to travel to relax and rejuvenate, Others seek picturesque landscapes, a kaleidoscope of cultures, or a buffet of new cuisines. And sometimes that means spending half your trip on the toilet, but that's part of the thrill of escape, right? Despite sneaking sentiments of Vimodalin, the frustration of photographing something amazing when thousands of identical photos already exist, we are still drawn to experience for ourselves and to share our experiences. Travel is a beautiful thing. It is also a booming multi-trillion dollar industry. In 2019, tourism accounted for a whopping 10.4% of global GDP and was responsible for roughly 10.3% of all jobs worldwide. Although it's taken a hit in revenue over the pandemic, it's already back on the road to its position of economic dominance. Mind you, this is despite the fact that, at least as of 2017, less than 20% of the world's population had ever flown. Considering its place of prominence, it's hard to deny the economic benefits of tourism globally. Drawn by the allure of distant destinations, tourists tend to invigorate local economies and create jobs. All that good stuff. But the catch-22 is that tourists can often put a strain on the very attributes that drew them to those destinations. The vibrant cultures that tourists come to enjoy become commodified for their passive consumption, rather than experienced as ever-evolving entities. The natural environments that tourists seek out are inevitably trampled by the incessant droves, or while those at the top reap the benefits that those who upkeep this industry do not. Gone are the days of uncomplicated travel. More than ever, we must confront and navigate the terrors of tourism, all the ethical quandaries imbued within the pursuit of one lust. Life could be a dream If I could take you up in paradise up above If you would tell me I'm the only one that you love On the gorgeous island chain nation of the Bahamas, the tourism industry has typically accounted for over 50% of the country's GDP. The aesthetic quality of its beaches, reefs, and resorts has made it an attractive destination for tourists across the world. The Bahamas is just one among many island nations that have come to rely on tourism for the health of its economy. Others, such as Barbados, Seychelles, Fiji, Aruba, Jamaica, and the Maldives, also depend on the complex network of transport providers, governments, businesses, and communities that constitute the tourism industry. While bringing significant revenue to these small islands, such profits have compared with the inherent risks of economic dependence. When the pandemic hit, its consequences on travel were especially felt on these island nations, as they had to find ways to survive while resorts sat empty, jobs dwindled, and flights stayed grounded. Things have slowly but not fully recovered to pre-pandemic levels, but even prior to the pandemic, let's not get it twisted, tourism has been both a blessing and a burden. Upon independence, both Jamaica and Barbados borrowed from foreign governments so they could build their tourism infrastructure. However, as the costs associated with paying off their loans and maintaining that infrastructure pushed them to near bankruptcy, they were left with no other choice but to request bailouts from the International Monetary Fund, which comes with certain structural adjustment strings attached, of which the locals suffered the consequences. But hey, at least the locals profit from the industry, right? Not quite. Much of the profit from tourism leaves the region. You've mystically referred to as leakage, there's a real discrepancy between gross and net tourism receipts. In the Caribbean, two-thirds of hotel rooms are foreign-owned, and the airlines that bring the most visitors, such as American, KLM, Air France, and British Airways, are also foreign-owned. With just a stroke of a keyboard, these airlines can determine which countries get more visitors based on how they influence the availability of their seats, their prices, and their flight schedules. And just when you thought they couldn't siphon any more money out of these islands, the introduction of all-inclusives has meant that even less money is reaching the folks on the ground through local restaurants, transport companies, and service providers. On top of all that, these islands lose money through their massive import bills. You see, most islands don't have the facilities to produce the goods their visitors need on a significant scale. 
So they have to import food, furnishings, equipment, and more just to make sure they can meet the expectations of tourists. Worse yet, most of the money that does end up in the pockets of locals is usually restricted to the local capitalist and political class. These elites live lavishly off the over and under table deals they've made with the foreign companies leeching off the islands, which has given them little incentive to pursue economic diversification in any meaningful way, trapping the region in the rut of economic dependence. As usual, the working class had a suck salt, suffering all the consequences and reaping little to none of the benefits. In fact, we get to see the continuation of colonialism through the tourism industry. As folks are denied access to their own beaches because a resort decided to set up shop, the best jobs go to non-nationals or those with the lightest complexions, and many locals working in the industry find themselves working in a servile capacity and performing cultural authenticity for their guests. In fact, you don't even have to be directly involved in the industry to feel the pressure to perform cultural authenticity. Being on a tourist-oriented island, many artists find themselves trying to meet the tourist gaze in order to make a livelihood. And yet, left with no other options, these folks largely embrace tourism as their means of survival as small island states. The economic dependence established by the tourism industry is not unique to island nations, nor is the exploitation of peoples and cultures in service of the tourism sector. Sometimes, that exploitation is direct and extreme, as seen in the practice of sex tourism that frequently bed to the human trafficking industry, and other times under the veneer of charity, as seen in the practice of volunteerism. But often, the exploitation is sight unseen by the visitors themselves. In Greece, wage slavery in the hospitality sector leaves much of the staff without basic labor protections like overtime compensation, insurance, days off, or livable wages. In Qatar, a country trying to become the premier destination for global sporting events and their associated tourism, a fluctuating population of heavily exploited migrant workers from South Asia and elsewhere make up the majority of the country, often trapped in situations where their passports are confiscated and they're subjected to long working hours in the hot sun on construction projects with inadequate pay and paltry living conditions. In the UK, Reuters found that despite the country's 2015 legislation against modern slavery, more than two-thirds of large hotel companies have not disclosed any information about the risk of slavery in their supply chains, from debt bondage to sexual exploitation. Across Southeast Asia, farms, forests, and villages have been destroyed to make way for golf courses and other tourist-oriented amenities. Slums are swept away so they won't offend visitors, but no alternative is provided to their former residents. East African Maasai communities have been fighting to protect their land for over a century, with justifications for their expulsion shifting from economic development to wildlife conservation, but in both cases ultimately for the benefit of outsiders, more recently for tourists seeking unspoiled nature. Tourists usually aren't the ones directly engaging in these forms of exploitation, but they are the ones whose ignorance fuels that exploitation. Many of our world's evils require not only active maleficence, but banal and unthinking ignorance. I don't think most people want to contribute to the exploitation of their fellow human beings, but unfortunately, under capitalism, you had to accept all the cookies. One of our greatest ethical challenges is dispelling that ignorance that allows these issues to persist. But these issues require more than just awareness to be resolved. Small tweaks can of course alleviate the worst of these conditions, but to take on the whole, We need revolutionary change on a systemic level. There are no easy answers. Tourism supposedly breaks down the barriers between our lives and those of the people we visit, but the extent to which these barriers are truly broken down really depends on the nature of our engagement. In many cases, it seems as though tourists remain behind barriers, whether it be the lens of a camera, the walls of a hotel room, or the windows of a tour bus, superficially interacting with the local people and reinforcing misunderstandings rather than dismantling them. Tourists are usually shielded from the reality of the countries they visit and serve their pre-packaged product meant to serve their preconceptions. So when reality does burst that bubble, it can reinforce the distance rather than bring them closer to those deemed foreign. As one Maasai man eloquently put it, we have ceased to be what we are. We are becoming what we seem. And then there are the environmental burdens placed by the tourism industry. The most obvious is the consequence of air travel and the environment, contributing an estimated 2.4% of global annual CO2 emissions. Another is the impact on the availability of fresh water. As one article in the World Impact of Tourism by Sir Crispin Tickle put it, 
15,000 cubic meters of water can irrigate one hectare of high yield in modern rice, support 100 nomads and 450 cattle for three years, maintain 100 rural families for three years and 100 urban families for two years, or meet the needs of 100 guests in a tourist hotel for 55 days. In service of the never-ending influx of tourists, destinations like Hawaii divert land and resources away from locals who now find their islands practically unlivable. The issue of over-tourism, one of suffering from success, has placed immense pressure on the health of ecosystems, strained the availability of land, water and energy, and presented a significant disruption to the lives of locals. Considering the burden of all these ethical dilemmas, it makes sense that many choose to disassociate from the label of tourist. Many tourists, myself included, complain about other tourists constantly. Their crowds, their litter, their bad manners, their walking on a bike lane, etc. Tourists, particularly of the American variety, are a world-renowned source of annoyance. Back in the day, besides the rich, very pleasure, but within a lifetime, tourism has become the world's biggest industry, with all its benefits and all its consequences. It has opened our minds and our horizons in ways unthinkable but also opened the floodgates of rampant consumption and destruction as well. So some people don't want to be tourists anymore. They rebrand. Oh, I'm not a tourist. I'm an adventurer, or I'm a traveler, or I'm an explorer-holic. These un-tourists distance themselves from the hordes of mass tourism, as they emphasize authentic and meaningful experiences, as opposed to guided attraction tours and superficial encounters. Untourists are particularly enamored with the desire to respect local culture. And that's a noble goal to have. You should educate yourself, ask before taking pictures, try not to touch anything, and yeah, take off your shoes when necessary. But also, try not to twist that respect into treating local cultures as too fragile or incapable of understanding difference, and then entirely abandoning your own principles, particularly in cases where their practices may be oppressive. Now, that's not to deny the very real consequences of cultural imperialism, which is why I'm trying to avoid sweeping statements, but I will say that it's important to recognize that true respect can only develop out of genuine exchange and understanding, going both ways. That's the only way you can get to the heart of our common aspirations and struggles. The cross-cultural connections we make can themselves be a radical act. But how else can we radicalize our approach to travel? How can we develop a reciprocal and mutually beneficial connection between ourselves as travelers and the places and peoples of our destination? We can take another look at the example of the Trobian Islanders of Papua New Guinea, who live not by the principle of the commodity, but by the principle of the gift. I mentioned them before in my surprisingly successful video on Bata. Today's travel has been overcome by commodification. But these people traveled great distances by sea in outrigger canoes and was exchanged ceremonial shell necklaces and armbands known as Sulava from island to island in a complex network of overlapping reciprocities. I think we've been going about travel all wrong. Perhaps it's not about the destination, it's about the relationship. Perhaps we need to follow a different travel pathway, one that embraces those reciprocal connections beyond the commercialized world of tourism. How can we facilitate give and take? If you've seen it, you'll know that in my past discussion on international solidarity, I emphasized the importance of trying to learn the language and culture of another and the need to develop a dialogue so you can see how you can contribute to their needs as they contribute to yours. It may be challenging to cultivate true reciprocity in the context of the inequality of opportunity and wealth found in many traveler-host relationships, but with effort, intention, and attentiveness, I think it could be done. As for how exactly... I'm not quite sure yet. I believe those answers lie beyond the boundaries of the established norms and commercial routes, where I have not yet ventured. But if you have, drop your stories in the comments. Another distinct yet connected approach would see us view not travel through the lens of the library, as we borrow a beach, a city, a mountain, or a rainforest with the knowledge that it is not ours to abuse with the knowledge that we must aim to maintain that which we borrow to the best of our ability for present and future generations. This approach also forces us to acknowledge that if such common resources are to be sustained, that we must temper our desires and consider the limits of their use. Perhaps if there are cues to climb Mount Everest, then we've taken things too far and should consider a different summit. Perhaps if those in Santorini have had to resort to desalination to ensure adequate water supply, 
we can reroute some of our voyages to avoid them and explore less trodden paths. I don't want you to view these scenarios in a purely personal context. These issues require collective action and systemic solutions. Changes that would see the complete involvement and ownership of local people in the decisions that affect their lives. A titanic transformation of the way we structure our global system that goes beyond the limits of this video and this topic alone. I mean, speaking of systemic change, I believe one of the reasons we are so drawn to these delightful destinations is that our most immediate environments are rather undelightful. We need a serious transformation of our urban planning approaches in order to make our own living spaces more attractive to live in so we aren't as agitated to flee to the world beyond. As I said in the beginning of this video, travel is a beautiful thing. Despite its ethical quandaries, I think it's one of the most vital components of our collective Buen Vivir. It just needs to be better. We need to do better. On the grand and grassroots scale. All power to all the people. Peace. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with fellow people. Thanks to the seedlings, the saplings, and especially the roots for making all this possible. Including our newest members, Aura, Kate Wilson, Gavin Bassesi, and Silvio Verrier. You can join these beautiful humans and support me too on patreon.com slash true. Check out my other videos for a range of radical topics. Thanks again. Peace.